Hello everyone, this is Alex Mu for IBC Amina for our monthly webinar. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Apologies for the, the background noise. Uh, it is a, a late afternoon over here. Um, we have a webinar on project management, which is something I think where many of us are struggling with at the moment. Uh, we are joined by a lady many of you will know, Anne Pelkinson. She is the owner and director of the PR Academy. Uh, Anne is an expert in the field, and she's going to be taking you through her approach to how we can better project manage. We are going to have questions at the end, um, so we will save those. And uh, Anne, over to you. Let's begin. Thanks very much, Alex, and uh, happy Halloween to everybody. I, I think there are a few witches in the background there with, with Alex. So um, welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining me uh, and Alex today for, for this webinar on project management. Um, I hope it's going to be interesting and insightful. I'm a passionate believer in project management, um, and that came from doing communications on large change programmes uh, and turning up to be quite baffled by all this project management terminology and process but actually leaving the first big program I did as, as a real convert um, so I think there's an awful lot that uh, those of us working in the world of PR and communication can learn from project management but by the same token I think um, there's an awful lot that we can offer the world of project management in terms of doing good communication on projects and we'll touch on that a little bit at the end so just a little bit about me. This is where I am today. This is uh, the River Thames. I'm lucky enough to live right by the Thames uh, in, in London. This is a sunset shot. It lo looks much more attractive at sunset. Um, there's a big sugar factory there, the Tate and Large Sugar Factory. So we love to sit and watch the big ships coming from the Caribbean carrying the, carrying the sugar cane. I think that's what they're doing anyway. So I'm talking to you from, from here in London uh, where um, I run PR Academy. Now, you might be wondering uh, why Alex has asked me to come along and do, do this webinar on project management when really what we do is all about uh, PR and comms. Um, but as I say, I was quite inspired by project management the first time um, I got involved on a big change programme. And it inspired me to write a book on the topic, Communicating Projects, which is designed to help communicators understand projects a bit better, but also to help project managers understand what communication can do for their projects. So um, that's a book I wrote a couple of years ago. It's published by Gower, who are now part of the Routledge Publication Group. Uh, I run PR Academy along with Kevin Ruck, who some of you may uh, also know, and Kevin's authored the book Exploring Internal Communication, so you may know him um, from that as well. So a couple of, of texts um, that we produce at PR Academy and um, communicating projects very relevant for today. So very quickly, a little bit about PR Academy. We're the largest um, teaching centre for the Chartered Institute of Public Relations Qualifications. We do all their qualifications online um, or face to face in London. And we've been doing that for a bit more than 10 years now. But we also deliver the um, fundamentals qualification in project management, which is accredited by the Association for Project Management, who've just become chartered, actually. Um, and they're one of two um, key bodies for project management, the other being the Project Management Institute. Um, so uh, we, we, at PR Academy, we combine um, both PR and comms training with, with some training in project management, particularly targeting uh, comms professionals. So what are we going to be talking about today? Um, project management is a big subject, so we can't possibly cover it all in, in the time we've got available. So what I've done here is, is, is sort of identified what I think are 10 key topics, um, facets, if you like, of, of project management, which will give us a bit of things to think about, um, things perhaps to go away and look at in a bit more detail. Um, so 10 key points um, right through from deciding if we're actually doing a project or not, uh, to talking a little bit about how we might plan communication on projects right at the end. So let's get going. 
But first of all, let's think about why we bother to plan. I just put this little quote in here. This is from Sir John Harvey Jones. He's no longer with us. He was quite a charismatic businessman um, here in the UK. He had a TV show where he'd go in and help businesses who were who were failing, uh, quite a larger than life character. But I love this quote. Planning is an unnatural process. It's much more fun to get on with it. The real benefit of not planning is that failure comes as a complete surprise and is not preceded by months of worry. And I think we can be a little bit guilty sometimes in the world of PR and communication of just wanting to crack on with things. But if we take a bit of time to plan and to think, um, then that will bring real benefits, not only to us in terms of managing our workload, but also to our organisations in terms of delivering things that give value for money um, and hopefully don't, don't only deliver to budget, but deliver on time as well. So the first thing I wanted to think about is actually defining a project. Now, this might seem really obvious, but actually, I think there's a couple of reasons why it's important to be clear about what a project is. Because very often when I talk to students, it's quite clear that they're working in an organisation that is running projects, but doesn't really treat them as projects. They haven't been identified as a project. And therefore, some of the uh, very basic project management methodology isn't being applied. And by the same token, some organisations treat everything like a project when it actually isn't really. So I think we just need to be clear about what a project is. So the Association for Project Management defines a project as a unique transient endeavour to achieve a desired outcome. So there's a couple of points about that definition. It's transient, you know, projects have a start and a finish. Again, sounds obvious, but that differentiates it from business as usual. And that's why I particularly enjoy working, uh, doing comms on projects, actually, because it's quite nice to be able to see that there's an end in sight. They're unique. Um, and that's another really important point. No two projects are the same. So even if you're delivering a staff town hall or, um, you know, some sort of away day or press trip or press conference, you might have done it before. But it will be different every time you do it. You might have a different budget. You might have a different team. You might be using a different venue. So although there are some things that we can take forward between one project and another, each one is actually unique. So just another couple of terms for you, because they're things you might hear in the world of project management, programmes and portfolios. I think of these quite simply a bit like a hierarchy. I think of a programme as a collection of projects and a portfolio can be a collection of programmes, projects and business as usual. And I've got the, the real sort of uh, definitions from, from the Association for Project Management there on the screen for you if, you, if you're uh, into that sort of thing. But just a little bit of jargon busting there, because certainly when I first um, turned up on a project, I was a little bit baffled by all the terminology. And there can be a bit of ego here. Sometimes on projects, people like to call themselves programme directors when it's not really a programme, it's a project because it sounds more important. So what is a project? I think it matters that we understand the difference. So they have a defined scope. It's clear about what you're going to do. Sometimes we use the term deliverables. So defined scope and deliverables. They're time bound. You start and finish are clearly defined, although, of course, the finish may change. They're unique. They're multidisciplinary. So that means you'll have people doing different tasks, different skill sets within a project. You'll have somebody on finance. Uh, you might have somebody um, who's uh, good on logistics, on events, or all sorts of different disciplines within a project. A project should have a single point of responsibility, and that person is the project manager. And of course, they have a strong implementa implementation bias. You're there to, to create something, to deliver a sort of change. And a project will always contain risk. And that's one thing we'll talk about uh, a little bit later on in the webinar. So is it a project? A few things to distinguish a project from business as usual. A project seeks to introduce change. So, um, you know, as communicators, particularly in internal communications, we are always working with projects because a change will usually be driven by a project. So projects limited by time, but business as usual is repetitive and indefinite. Um, there's a specified scope. Uh, and when you develop a product, the first time you do it, it might be a project, but then it goes into production and becomes business as usual. And we're doing something once as opposed to business as usual, which does it repeatedly. So it's worth just thinking about, do you have something going on um, that you think actually that is a project and we should be treating it as such? 
or maybe there's something that's business as usual and it's getting treated as a project and perhaps then overdoing it if you like and, and you don't need all that project methodology. But if you have got a project, um, then it's good to be aware of that and, and treat it as a project. And I should just say at this point that what I'm going to talk about here today are some broad principles around project management. Obviously, there are different methodologies. We have PRINCE2 and we have Agile. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about those today. So I'm talking really about some quite simple, basic principles around project management. So project roles, who does what on a project? Um, and it's worth just thinking here that you know, a project can be of any type. You know, if you're creating, uh, having a dinner party, planning a wedding, they're all projects. Um, we have a great show here in the UK, and I'm, I'm sure it's repeated around the world, called MasterChef, uh, when professional or amateur chefs complete, compete for a, a title. Um, and there was one a competitor I saw, um, and I think he went on to be a finalist, but, but not win, but he was a finalist, who had a Gantt chart on his workbench, because actually creating his menu for the competition, he was treating it like a project. So projects can be of any kind. And they can be very detailed and complex, or they can be quite simple. But some of the things that if you are acting as a project manager, you should be thinking about are these. So a project manager is responsible for pe preparing a business case. And we'll talk about that shortly as well. They capture the requirements, you know, what's needed here. And that's something we'll touch on in a second specify uh, the end product, do all the documentation around that and get it agreed with stakeholders. They're in charge of budgets and estimates, getting the organization on board, managing the project plan. And then there's all the motivational staff looking after stakeholders, managing suppliers. Also responsibility for risks and issues, which is something we're gonna talk about today. Change control. So, you know, somebody uh, wanted an event uh, that was going to be an afternoon, um, perhaps just with a, with a with an afternoon tea break. And suddenly that's changed into an all day thing with a sit down lunch. Somebody has to manage that change. And they're responsible for closing the project out. And I think from a comms perspective, actually, just to say, I think project closure is quite a key stage and something that, um, you know, is often um, let slip, if you like, because projects are often made up of groups of people who come together for the project and then disperse at the end. And you really want to make sure that you're capturing your lessons learned and making sure that um, any communications uh, products that were part of the project are handed over into business as usual as well. So it's quite a bit to do around project closure. It's not just pack up and go home. One of the key roles on a project is the sponsor. Now, the sponsor isn't uh, a day-to-day -day member of the project team. The sponsor has probably got a day job within the organization. They might be a finance director, or perhaps in a university setting, they might be one of the senior academics, perhaps. But they have a really, really key role to play. They're responsible for the business case. So that means they're responsible for delivering the benefits that the project says that it's going to deliver, and these should be documented in the business case. But they're also really helpful from a comms perspective. So if we just put our communications hats on here for a moment, if we're supporting um, a project or a programme, the sponsor is a really good person to get alongside because they can talk peer to peer with other stakeholders. They can sometimes unlock issues and problems that we may be struggling with as the comms person. So the sponsor role on a project is a really, really key one. And it's important that the sponsor understands that role. You know, sometimes people are given this uh, title of sponsor and think it just means turning up to a meeting and, and sharing it. But there's actually a lot more they can do to really benefit the project. So projects need a sponsor. So let's imagine perhaps that you're running um, an internal communications event um, to talk about a new strategy or something like that. You, you want to think about who the sponsor of that is. It could well be the, the director of HR, perhaps. So somebody who's not day to day part of the project setup, um, but has um, overall responsibility for, for delivering the benefits, if you like. And as I say, can also unlock perhaps some challenging relationships um, with peers within the organisation. So the sponsor in a project is a really key role. So let's talk a little bit about requirements. That's one of the things that the project manager will be responsible for. And the requirements really just means being clear what is required. Um, does what it says on the tin is an expression we sometimes use here in the UK. 
And I just use this lovely example to, to make the point, really. Um, now, I'm sure many of you will have your equivalent of the TV show The Apprentice. Um, I think it's what um, launched Donald Trump's media career in the US. And here in the UK, we have Alan Sugar, um, who's the uh, businessman at the forefront of, of this TV programme. And if you're not familiar with it, essentially what happens is lots of um, hopefuls come along, join the show um, and compete to win investment or a job with the, the business guru who fronts it. And on this particular task, Lord Sugar sent the uh, contestants out to purchase uh, a medical skeleton. And they had to do it as cheaply as possible, along with a load of other things that they had to buy. And one group came back having spent very little money on this medical skeleton, but it was a sort of cardboard one that you self-assembled. And the other team had bought one that was actually all made out of plastic and, and kind of life size. And Alan Sugar really criticised um, the guys who'd bought the cardboard one and, and said, well, that's, you know, it's just not right. You know, you, you've just bought this cardboard thing. Um, and so chastised them for it. But as in this article here that appeared at the time, and as I would have argued at the time, he didn't specify there wasn't a requirement that this medical skeleton had to be full size, made of plastic, you know. He didn't tell them that that was his requirement. So actually, he couldn't really justifiably criticise the people who'd come back with the cardboard flat packed one. So it's just the same on projects, you know, what are the requirements? And if we don't button those down and get them right, all sorts of misunderstandings and problems can arise. And it's difficult because you're dealing with suppliers and they may be thinking, well, I thought you wanted this. And, and you're thinking, no, I said I wanted that. So buttoning down the requirements is really, really important. And sometimes I do a little exercise with, with, uh, with students where I get them to write the requirements for, for a car, for a new car. And it's amazing how often people forget to put things like the wheels or the steering wheel, some of the basic things you just kind of assume that people will know you want, but we can't really assume. So requirements is a really, really important uh, part of project management. So Having gathered our requirements, um, one of the things that um, often comes into play in projects is change. And this is, um, I think, quite a helpful concept to be thinking about in terms of project management. And I think it helps us to understand why sometimes as uh, communications practitioners, we're rushing around trying to do so much work when we haven't really got the time or the budget to do it all. And so we're working till goodness knows what time of night. And it's what we call the iron triangle of project management. And essentially what it means is that a project, um, and there are different uh, versions of this model, sometimes they go into a bit more detail, but I quite like this very simple triangle one. A project is a balance between, between time, cost and quality or scope, quality or scope. And essentially what this means is that if there's a change in the scope, then you're also going to have to change the time and the cost, or maybe, maybe just one of them, because you can't do something of increased scope without giving yourself more time or having more money in which with which to do it. By the same token, if you reduce the scope, you might be able to reduce the time or the cost. And that can be something that you may have to do in a project. If you're finding that you have to hit a particular deadline, you may have to reduce the scope in order to do so. And by the same token, if somebody comes along and says, well, we haven't got the budget that we did have, then maybe you can increase the time available and still deliver the same uh, quality. Or you're going to have to reduce the, the scope or quality of what you're um, of, of what you're delivering. And I think this model is quite helpful for us uh, in, in the world of communications, particularly because sometimes when, when somebody wants to change our scope, take our budget or tell us um, that they want it tomorrow when originally they said they wanted it in six weeks time, um, it can be quite a difficult conversation to, to explain why that just can't happen. So sometimes having a model, a piece of methodology like this to have a conversation around helps to depersonalise that conversation um, and gives a structure to a conversation around time, cost and quality. So I really like this. I think it's a really useful uh, little model to help us to manage workloads, manage changes in scope, um, time and cost. So. Iron Triangle, worth just having in the back of your mind, um, because it does remind us why sometimes we, we think, gosh, we just can't do it all in the time that we've got. 
But what do we mean by quality? Um, and it's worth just um, thinking about this uh, briefly, because I suppose to most of us, quality means something that's really, really good. Here are some gorgeous cars. I drive an Audi myself, although it's, uh, it's quite an old one, I have to say. Um, and it is a very good quality car. You know, when you shut the door, there's a nice thud as it closes properly. And the seats are very nice and comfortable. It's a quality car. But in project terms, quality can also mean something else. It can mean whether the product is right for what's required. So we look at these two rather nice cars here. If you're um, taking the family out to the, the country cottage uh, for, for the weekend um, and you want to take the dog and a couple of bikes, then your nice big Audi Q7 um, is the car that you want because it meets the need that you have. But if actually, you know, you, you just want some nice fancy weekends in the country, staying in a nice hotel, it's just two of you going, you've just an overnight bag, you haven't got a dog, you haven't got bikes, then that lovely little sporty TT will do the job. So they're both quality cars, but what we mean in project management um, around quality is also whether it's right for the task in hand. Uh, and trying to get the whole family, two dogs and a couple of bikes in the TT just isn't gonna work. So quality, just worth having that in mind, what it means when we're in, when we're in project, project land, project mode. So we've touched a bit on business cases. <clears throat> now, the business case is something that the project manager will produce probably or might get somebody to help them, um, but they take responsibility for its production. But it's owned by the sponsor. Now, every project should have a business case. Um, and these can be, you know, to, to a greater or, or lesser degree. If it's a very small, simple project, it might be a very small, simple, straightforward document. But on a big, complex project or programme, the business case is going to be quite a detailed document. Um, it talks about different options and it gives a justification for, for what you're going to do. And I would say as well, putting our communications hats on here, if, if we turn up on a change project to help to deliver communications, then the business case is one of the first documents that we need to look at because it should help us understand um, what the project is there to do. So the business case sets out um, why we're going to do it, why this change or this product is needed. And it gives the options, it helps whoever's going to sign it off to evaluate the options um, and agree with the, the proposed um, way forward or perhaps have a conversation around you know, the different options and what may or may not be better. A business case should also uh, look at the impact on business as usual. You know, do you have the capacity to deliver this project? It should include scope, so at a high level, um, what's the scope of the project? What benefits it's going to bring? how it's going to be delivered commercially, um, what suppliers, all that kind of thing, how are they going to be contracted. It should also look at risks and have a sort of high level schedule about um, how this project is going to be delivered. So the business case then is, is a, a really important document for project management, both if you're running a project and if you're turning up to do communications on a project because it helps us to get our own thoughts in order, if, if you like. If we have to set out something in a business case format, it really helps us to marshal our thoughts and think about some of these key things like impact on business as usual. Can we uh, cope with this additional work and how are we going to? So some of the few, a few of the terms that you um, may find, we've talked a bit about um, benefits already. So I thought it's just be useful again to, to debunk a few terms that we have in the world of project management. Um, so benefits, um, I won't read out all, all, the, all the detail on the slide there, um, but um, let's say we're building a new website. Um, you may get more people signing up as members because it's a better experience, for example. So a benefit, a quantifiable improvement um, in something. Success criteria, um, this is another term that you might hear. Um, it's measures by which the success of the project is judged. Was it on time? Was it on cost? You know, is this new website as fast as we said it would be? KPIs, key performance indicators. Um, these are things that um, will help us check along the way if we're going to be successful. So it might be if it's a new website, um, have we um, tested all 
tested for faults and addressed the faults by a certain time. If you're running an event, uh, a KPI might be getting all the invitations out and having a certain number of RSVPs back by a certain point in time. So key performance indicators um, are used to help us see how we're progressing towards a successful con conclusion of the project. Something a little bit different, but can get a bit confused because it sounds a bit the same as success criteria, is success factors. And it's worth thinking on a project, what factors will help you to be successful? And this is often where comms comes in, actually. So you may decide that um, you need a clear vision for the project. You need a motivated team, stakeholders that are on board, whatever it is. So what are the success factors that will enable you to deliver a successful project? And very often a, a project will have things like communications, stakeholder engagement in, in this kind of category. So there's a bit more just um, about business cases. Um, at PR Academy, we've, we um, have a, a sort of sister website, if you like, which is an online um, resource um, and, and thought thought space, I suppose. It's where we try to bring academia and practice together, PR place. Um, and we've got a, a guide on there to writing reports, proposals and business cases. Um, so do, do check it out if you think it would be useful. Because a business case um, should be quite persuasive and engaging you know you you want your organization to buy into this proposal that you're making for 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 an event or for, or for some kind of change so you know we need to be able to write in in a structured organized and quite engaging and, and um persuasive way sometimes so if that would be of use it's there on pr play so so do check it out so a little bit about planning now. Um, so this is um, all, all good stuff and you'll have heard again uh, of, of some of the terminology here. And I think it's always good to, to, to debunk a bit of, bit, bit, bit of jargon and terminology on project management because it can all seem a bit bizarre if it's something you're not used to. So I'm going to talk in a second about something called the critical path. Um, so what the critical path does, sometimes it's called a network diagram, um, and we do it um, based on precedence. So that means when we're thinking about all the tasks that we have to do for this project, we need to think about how long each of them is going to take and what we have to do before we can do something else. So I think quite a useful example, and it's not a comms one, but I think it's quite a good way to illustrate it that we can all get our heads around, is building a house or building an extension. Now it's obvious really that you need to get planning consent before you can start, you need to dig your footings before you can build your walls, and you need to put the plumbing in before you can plaster the walls. Although I've worked with had some really bad builders that don't seem to follow that methodology, but anyway. Um, so that's what we mean by precedent. What have we got to do? How long it's going to take? Um, when, what order do we have to do things in? And it's worth just no noting here that sometimes on projects, um, we are given the end date before we do the plan. And really, we should do this planning to come up with the um, uh, achievable end date, if you like. So the overall duration of the projects and when things should happen. Um, because if we're given an end date and we find that when we've done this planning, it doesn't work, what do we do? Well, we probably have to reduce the scope, go back to our iron triangle, reduce the scope or throw more money at it so we can get more people, so we can reduce the amount of time that things are going to take. So a lot of things in project management do come back to that triangle. It helps us to plan the resources that are needed. I mean, where I'm living at the moment, um, there's lots of new building around me and there's some huge machinery turns up. So you need to know when you need that machinery on site because it's very expensive to hire um, and somebody else might have it booked in. So doing this kind of planning helps you to allocate resources at the right time also plan funding and it's good for comms because you can then tell stakeholders what to expect when. So critical path then is really um, a network diagram that is based on precedence. So there's just a little example here um, and we could spend a whole webinar on, on doing a critical path. But the critical path is the bit in red and this is the bit that can't be allowed to slip because there's no what I might call wriggle room, if you like. 
so very often this is done on software so it's not something that usually we would do manually but it's very helpful to understand what a critical path is in the process and if you do a very simple critical path it shows you the things that can't be allowed to slip because they'll throw the whole project out and extend the end date and therefore the things that you should monitor more closely and give priority to resources to keep them on track whereas some of the other things um, have a little bit of in project management terms what is called float i like to call it wriggle room um, which means you've got a few days a little bit of a little bit of flexibility in the schedule so that's what we mean when we talk about planning the critical planning and the critical path it's also worth thinking about your your um your resources as well um, in terms of doing um, what we call a responsibility assignment matrix and that simply means looking at the work that you have, which, you'll have, which you can break down into to discrete packages of work, and the organisation that you have, and allocating that work to people in the organisation. Again, it's very simple, very much common sense, but a bit of um, a little bit of structure and methodology around it might suddenly make you realise, gosh, you know, we've got a lot more people than we need, or we haven't got enough people. And again, it's about managing resources um, and it helps you to perhaps ask for more resource, because if you just say to somebody, well, we're really busy and we need more help, it's a little bit vague and they may just think, well, you're just saying that, aren't you? But actually, if we can do something quite structured that shows quite clearly, this is all the work that we have to do. And this is how we've assigned the work to um, people within our project organisation. Um, and we've got some gaps then it's much clearer um, and a good basis for a conversation about getting more resource or maybe reducing the scope. And it works the other way because you may suddenly find that you've got more people than you need, um, in which case you may be able to move those people onto other jobs um, or um, maybe even um, you know, bring everything a little, bit, a little bit to the left so you can utilize the people a bit better. So change control, this is another important part of project management um, and change control, um, as we touched on a bit earlier, is really about a change of scope. Um, and this does have to be managed. Um, and it's very helpful if you're doing communications on a project that you become part of the change control process if possible, because that will give you a heads up on changes and it may, affect, it may impact on the communication that you're doing if something's about to change. You can also bring a very sort of stakeholder perspective to the project as well um, and something may be planned as a change and you may spot that that could have um, quite an impact on a particular group of stakeholders when other people may not have realised that. So change control then, you should have a proper process um, on a small project, it can be quite informal, it doesn't have to be documented uh, to a great degree, but on a more complex project you do want to document it. So if somebody wants to make a change, they should come to the project with the proposal for the change, which should be impact assessed by others on the project or perhaps by stakeholders before that change is either approved or not approved. And if it is approved, actually is implemented. So you do need some um, change control. And it's also good to document it because I know very often at PR Academy we make changes to courses and sometimes you think, gosh, you know, why, why did we choose that book over that book? And if you go back and look, ah, it's because of X, Y, Z. So sometimes it's easy to forget why we made the changes that we did. So change control is really um, important um, and it can be helpful if you're the one doing the communications on a project as well. So risk and issues is um, nearly our final aspect of project management that I was going to talk about today. Um, I think as communicators, we're, we're pretty good at this, actually. We're pretty good at spotting risks and dealing with issues, aren't we? It's, it's kind of our bread and butter sometimes. In project terms, a risk is about exposure to uncertainty and it's the likelihood of loss or a bad event, but it could also be an opportunity. And the lady that teaches project management with me, Mary, she's a very experienced project manager. She always says to me, Anne, it's, um, it's risk and opportunity. And I think a really good example of this, um, it, for example, could be um, 
one that I use sometimes is McDonald's who have started to introduce a lot more healthy food in their stores so um, whereas the uh, criticism of, of burgers and chips as being unhealthy was a, was a risk to the business they've actually turned that into an opportunity by stocking more healthy food so sometimes opportunity can come out of risk it's important to realize on projects that um, very often uh, project managers will see risk as a threat to project success criteria and that means they don't necessarily always think about it in reputation terms and I think this is where us as comms people can come in and bring that sort of more uh, stakeholder external perspective and think about risks and the impact on reputation more, more widely. Risks have a composite value and we'll look at that in a second. Um, and issues are different. Issues are risks that have materialised. So it's a problem. It's something we're dealing with now. Now, every project should have a risk log or might be called a risk register and also one for issues. Um, and you may find that, uh, you, you know, your organisation has one that it just runs all the time, almost as part of business as usual. But if you're running an event or, um, you know, the, the employee event or a press trip or something like that, thinking about risk and documenting it is, is really important and as I said I think it's something we're quite good at as comms people. Um, they have a composite value so that means that risks they're not all the same um, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the concept of red risks and sometimes on projects they're so serious they're actually black because we run out of red. Uh, this is a very simplistic view of how you um, assess risk but I think it just makes the point quite simply really. You think about the likely impact of something happening. Um, if it happens, is it really serious? So it's quite high, but actually the probability is quite low. So you're down in that bottom right hand uh, corner. But actually, if you've got something that could have quite a high impact on what you're doing and it's quite likely to happen, so the probability is high, then that's a red risk or possibly even a black risk, depending how your organisation uh, looks at risk. And some organisations will have their own methodology for doing this. Sometimes they have numerical values. I've seen, you know, quite complicated spreadsheets where you put all the factors in and it comes up with a with, with a composite value and helps you to assess the degree of risk. So it can be a lot more complicated, but essentially this is what you're doing. You say, is it likely to happen? If it does, what's the impact? Then how much do I need to worry about it? And then you should log it. You know, you should be running a risk log or risk register, which will... Um, describe the risk and um, also assign an owner to it and it's important with risk that that owner is always a person not a department because you really need some to, somebody to be on point um, and managing that risk for you um, and doing as much as they can to make sure it doesn't happen or thinking about what they would do if it did. Um, so risks and issues then really really important part of project management. So finally, I just want to talk a little bit about communications on projects. Um, just to, I, I think the good thing about understanding projects is it really, really helps us to deliver communications on change because ch projects are about change. Any change we're doing should be delivered by a project. And it can be helpful to understand where you are in the project life cycle. So um, this is a, what we call waterfall with an agile project. It would be a bit different because it's much more iterative. Um, but projects have, um, in this uh, way of looking at them, um, distinct phases. And I think what this shows us is that we don't need to always communicate with everybody in the same way at the same time. So, for example, at the outset, you might just be looking for awareness before you want behaviour change a bit further along in the project cycle. And also you'd be wanting to talk to different stakeholders at different times. So I think if we understand this project life cycle, it can really help us to design our communication strategy accordingly. Who do we need to be talking to at which stage and what sort of outcome do we want from that relationship at that particular point in the project life cycle? It also helps us to signpost. I think one of the biggest challenges on doing um, project communication is ambiguity. You know, projects by their very nature, you, you kind of know what the outcome's going to be, but actually there are things that you need to work out as you go. Um, and often our sort of stakeholders or employees, they think we know all the answers, um, but actually we don't because the project is still in progress. 
And I think one of the ways to deal with that is what I call signposting. And understanding the project structure helps you to do that because you can explain to stakeholders, this is where we are in the project, and this is what we have to do to get to the next stage when we'll be able to engage you again or tell you more about what we're doing. So understanding that project life cycle really helps us to deal with the potential ambiguity that we get in project communication. So, so sort of finally, really, um, if you want to know more about communication on projects, um, as I say, it's, it's the subject of the book that I've written. Uh, you can download a free chapter two on, on PR Place. Um, the link's there or just go to prplace.com and you'll find it. Um, and I hope that that might be useful if you're involved uh, in the world of doing comms on change projects. I've also got some articles on the Project Management World Journal Library. Um, so again, just go to um, PM World Library and look for my name. There's quite a lot of articles on there, again, that are more around um, doing comms on projects. Um, so looking at, at projects from, from the communications perspective. So thank you. That's our, my introduction to project management. I hope it's been useful and perhaps given you a few things to think about um, and very happy to um, take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Anne. You can post questions via the question box. Just write your question down and uh, then I will read it out to Anne. Um, and I'm going to start off with a question. Does it get easier? doing project management because it can initially <laughs> seem like there's a lot of work involved and I think this this often puts people off. That's a really great question Alex and it's it's always the thing isn't it when we talk about planning um, communications and doing comm strategies um, is that it can seem like it's a lot of work and then you know things kind of change and why why bother but actually i think this can all be done quite simply I and mean, if you're on a very big complex project or program then this can take a long time obviously but actually the things that we've talked about here can be done quite quickly you know get a few people around the table scope out the work that needs to be done think about who's going to do it what it's going to cost um, think about the risks and the issues. It doesn't need to take a long time. And I think time spent planning frees up time in the end because what it does, it stops us doing things um, that we may not need to do. Um, it helps us to, to manage our workload. So actually a bit of time spent planning up front, I, I think can save, save time at the end of the day. Wonderful, thank you, Anne. Any questions? Okay, we have one question which has come through. Uh, just give me one second while I pull it out. So are there any handy tools you can recommend that assist with project management? This is from Caddy. Caddy. Hello, Caddy. Thank you for that question. Um, there's lots of software. You have Microsoft Project, um, which a lot of big projects use. To be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of, of project software because I'm not a project manager. You know, my background is PR and communications. Um, I, I've worked on lots of projects. I've studied project management um, to a sort of higher higher level. But but I think actually just using some of the the little um, techniques that um, I've talked about today um, can be really really helpful. Um, if you use Project Microsoft Project, then um, if it's not something you're familiar with, you might need a bit of help in, in putting all the information. Um, but but I think actually just doing things quite simply. Um, on, on, you know, on, on pieces of paper, um, it is all you need. So, for example, doing the, the network diagram and your critical path, um, I think if it's a small project, you can do that quite simply yourself, thinking about precedence, what needs to happen before something else happens, how long is it going to take. And one of the things there just to add is that um, where we can sort of get into trouble with doing that is we can be overly optimistic on how long things are going to take. So we always need to be realistic about how long how long jobs take. Breaking down your work into to sort of discrete um, packages, if you like, and then thinking about who's going to do it. I think some of these very simple techniques that we've talked about today, um, you can do quite simply with, without needing um, anything too complicated. OK, thank you very much, Kelly, for the question. We have another question from uh, Indranil. Um, so according to you, you know, we, we need to keep a percentage in terms of change in a project. So 
what what should we factor when it comes to that percentage of change and how do we um, manage um, or handle to align all stakeholders on on a change uh, if needed so we're talking here I think if I'm right about a change in the scope of the project or perhaps it's the case that um, the, the time scale is as it has grown has slipped is that is that what we is that yes what we're talking yeah. about? yes yeah any, okay. any major change to the uh, essentially the timelines or any of the deliverables essentially yeah, so I, I think that's a really good question, and I think it's one of the biggest challenges if we're doing comms on projects um, is to deal with the, um, the ambiguity, but also slippages. I mean, I'll just give you an example here in London. Um, they're presently building a uh, crossrail, which is um, a new underground line that's going to go east to west. It's an amazing project. Um, but they've just announced that it's going to be a year late. And I'm very cross because I <laughs> I moved somewhere where I was expecting there to be a crossrail station. Um, so I think it happens. I mean, my, my thought about this is that when we're actually on the project, we can get quite concerned. You know, it, it doesn't look good, obviously, if things are going to take longer than we originally said. But I actually think stakeholders are much more understanding of that than we sometimes think they're going to be. Um, and a lot of this is about um, keeping stakeholders engaged throughout the project. I think what happened on Crossrail is that it, there was no hint that things were going to be delayed. And suddenly out of nowhere, there's this really, really long delay. And that often, often comes, I think, from projects being um, quite concerned to give a positive a positive impression all of the time. So trying to make out that everything's great, it's going brilliant. And sometimes we have to be honest and say that things are challenging. We have to look to our stakeholders for help because I think with projects, if we get too concerned with everything always seeming positive, it causes us trouble when things do slip and go wrong. But if we ask our stakeholders for help, talk to them about how they can help us um, rather than always trying to make them feel positive about the project, I think they're going to be more understanding if things do change. I think the change impact process is important. Um, so making sure that changes are properly assessed for impact. And that might mean chatting to stakeholders and saying to them, this is what's proposed. You know, how would it affect you? It's very much about engaging stakeholders through the whole life cycle um, as appropriate, I think. OK, thank you very much, Janelle, for the question. Do we have any other questions? OK, now this is an interesting one. This is going to be a very, <laughs> could be a very long answer. So Madhava asks, how do we balance change management? Um, there's a lot of ways you can interpret that. Could you say that again, Alex? How do we balance? How do we balance change management? So I think basically, how do you, you know, how do you plan for various outcomes, and how do you manage to to keep things essentially on level? I think that's what uh, Madhav is alluding to. Is that correct, Madhav? Let's see, let's see how many it takes to respond. So how how do we do that? How do we? Yeah, okay. So how do we manage all these different factors and and make sure that we you know, balance out time, money, um, and also uh, resources. Absolutely, and, and I think that's that's really what project management enables us to do, because I think very often, um, and I, the thing is with PR and comms people, we're very willing and very helpful, and we just want to get on and do the best job for our businesses and our clients. But I think if we um, stop and apply some project management principles, that's exactly what project management is there to help us do, because it it, it helps you to if you, you're scoping out the work. So you're being very clear about what it is that has to be delivered. Um, you're thinking about how long it's going to take you to do all the various tasks in order to deliver that that project, that, you know, that outcome, that. Um, event, product, whatever it is. Um, 
it helps you um, to think about how many people you've got, the resources that you've got, and whether you've got enough people to do something, or if you have got too many people to do something. So applying these project management principles, I think that's exactly what project management does. It helps you achieve that balance. Um, because sometimes you might just have to say to the organization, do you know what, we've, we, we, we've got too much change. We don't have the resources or the budget to implement this particular change at this time. And because we're doing it to a methodology, because we're using project management principles, it gives us a structure, it gives us something to have that conversation around, um, rather than just saying, we've got too much to do, we can't do it. It's providing evidence um, of the resources that are available. So I think that's absolutely what project management is there to do, is to help us balance all these demands, all these changes um, on organisations um, that, that come along at any one time. Okay, thank you. We have the last question. It's from Indranil. Um, how do we measure the outcome of any project where ROI is not an evident number? Now, this is going to be an interesting one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what's your advice? So, so this is we we've got a project and and it's not a financial return. Is that is that what we're, we're essentially? Saying? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I, so I think this comes back to agreeing the objectives or the scope and the benefits at the very start of the project. So the business case is key here. So your business case should set out what the benefits are going to be. And then the organisation should sign up to that business case. You know, every project should have a project board. Um, and remember the sponsor role here, the sponsor is responsible for the benefits. So the business case should be um, approved, it should be signed up to, and the benefits should be captured in there. And if those benefits aren't financial, then that's where that will all be agreed and the organisation will make a decision about whether or not it wants to go ahead with the project based on the benefits that have been um, outlined. It's a bit different, I suppose, if, if we say we're going to um, achieve some financial benefits and then we don't, which is a, that's a slightly different question. And it's a bit like that. It's a, it's a bit like the question about what happens if things slip and change. You know, it, it's it's the same. It's the same point, really. It's about engaging stakeholders um, throughout the life of the project um, and and managing expectations a bit, really, not not trying to present everything as in the garden as being rosy. And if we think we're not going to get the financial benefits that we first thought, being able to explain why that is. Are we still there? Okay, I don't know if um, Alex, you can still hear me. Sorry, I'm I'm here. I was just on mute for a second. So, okay, uh, we have one more one more question from Madhav, which is. What do you advise people who are newly joined in comms to do when it comes to project management? Where should they begin? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. So um, I, I'm a, a big fan of project management. I think all comms people can benefit from understanding the principles of project management, not just to apply them to their own work if they like to be running a project, but because so often in organisations now as comms people, we're asked to support change projects. And you can do that so much more effectively if you understand the principles of project management. So. I think, you know, get yourself on a course and that might be uh, a good place to start or ask somebody very often in big organisations, they might have sort of project centres of excellence. Um, go and talk to somebody, sit alongside somebody who's um, working in a project. It, big projects will have a, um, something called the, the, P, the PMO, which is the project management office. Um, they're often good people to explain to you how projects work. So try and get involved in projects in the organisation, you know, sit alongside somebody, learn how it works. Again, because many organisations will have their own project methodology, their own way of delivering projects. Look at an introductory course, you know, the, um, I mean, we do one at PR Academy, obviously, but, you know, the PMI, the um, ones accredited by the Association for Project Management in the UK, the, the fundamentals qualification is a really, really good introduction 
pick up a book you know that's another a good way to do it look for a book on introductions to project management and um and have a read but but maybe an introductory course or, or sitting alongside somebody for, for a day shadowing somebody on a project will be a really good introduction wonderful thank you very much Anne. Uh, our hour is up so our time is done um and i think it's fair to say we've handled this project pretty well <laughs> Uh, everyone here, you will get a video recording of this just in case um, you you missed anything. And if you do have any more questions, please fire them over and we will send them to Anne. Um, but Anne, I want to say thank you for your time and thank you for presenting to us on this topic. Not at all. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for the invitation. Wonderful. And everybody who's out there, enjoy your Halloween. Hopefully you don't get scared too much by all the ghouls and goblins. Okay, have a good <laughs> one. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.